welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast, your home for weekly information and inspiration to help you get the graduate job of your dreams. Hello and welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast with your host, James Curran. The Graduate Job Podcast is your home for all things related to helping you on your journey to find an amazing job. Each episode, I bring together the best minds in the industry, speaking to leading authors, graduate recruiters and career coaches who bring decades of experience into a bite-sized weekly 30-minute-ish show. Put simply, this is a show I wish I had when I graduated. And welcome to the 129th episode of the show. Like the proverbial bad penny, I'm back to dispense some classic careers advice joined by the brightest and best in the world of graduate recruitment. As today, we have friend of the show, Brian Sinclair, back with us. Brian is back to discuss his brilliant new book, 28 Recruitment Mistakes and How You Can Avoid Them. Now, no matter what company you're applying to, no matter what the graduate scheme is, no matter what stage of the process you're at, this episode is going to help. So without further ado, let's get straight into it. But before we do, quick message to say that if you want some expert career coaching to help you get through a graduate interview or assessment centre, I'm your man. Check out the show notes at graduatejobpodcast.com slash mistakes where you can find out more. You only get one shot at each company, so don't leave anything to chance. Okay, on with the show. I'm very pleased to welcome back to the show for the third time, graduate recruitment guru, friend of the show, and now best-selling author as well. Welcome, Brian Sinclair. Hey, James. Thanks for having me on again. Really pleased to be here. No, thank you for joining us. And today we are going to uh, discuss in detail your new, and as I mentioned, best-selling book. Here. No, thank you for joining us. And today we are going to uh, discuss in detail your new, and as I mentioned, best-selling book, 28 Recruitment Mistakes and How You Can Avoid Them, advice from over 15 years of graduate recruitment experience. So, Brian, it's been uh, it's been a couple of years since you were last on the show with episode 93, when you talked about getting a graduate job at DS Smith. So, uh, mm. yeah, do you want to fill us in on what you've been up to uh, over these last couple of years? Yeah, so I, I was I had a cracking time at the uh, Smiths. Really loved what they did and working for those guys. Um, it was an interim gig, uh, which I was really grateful to have. With actually two interim gigs, they they liked me so much they brought me back for a second uh, interim gig. But then uh, I got offered a full time permanent role uh, and left them in May last year. I've been with uh, another company since then, and I'll be changing roles again soon. So onwards and upwards, change. Still all in graduate recruitment, grad development, that kind of early career space. I still still kind of love that area. And the kind of part of history. It was initially an idea to do a presentation um, at a career services. I just found it's it's in the book in detail. But it was basically, I realised students were being given lots of advice of what they should do, but there was very little in there of well don't do it that way or actually don't actually do do that at all uh, their interpretation of some of the advice was a little bit off shall we say so what i started doing was sharing uh, at various university events here's what i think you should do instead here's what i've seen someone actually doing in in the university or at, at an assessment center or, or in an interview and i was thinking oh dear <laughs> maybe not so i kind of shared some of those stories back but then i said well i can't just tell them all what not to do so i was saying well here's actually some examples of what to do instead, or here's where I've seen it done well based on either a candidate getting a job or the hiring manager being very happy with what was actually done. And then started to share that and then kind of did that a couple of times over different universities. It seemed to go down quite well. It was happy with what was actually done. And then started to share that and then kind of did that a couple of times over different universities. It seemed to go down quite well. It was an unusual way, a unique, different way, I suppose, of giving those insider tips and information um, to the to the students. You know, it was like a, a bunch of graduate outtakes, but it wasn't wasn't the graduates in the rooms. They could share from learn from other people's mistakes. Um, and then just kind of did it on and off over a few years. Then I had to write out the presentation in more detail because it got to the stage where other people were trying to deliver it as well, people I was working with. So I was trying to write some you know, fairly detailed notes and a lot of the stories and examples in there. Um, and then uh, I was made redundant for that job where I was. Then lockdown happened, and I just said, "Well, when I looked at all the notes, 
um, for actually notes on a PowerPoint slides. I thought, wow, I've put them all into a word. Let's see just how much this actually is. It racked up about 12,000 words. So I said, hang on, how much do I need for a book? Um, and I wrote kind of a fact book. Um, and then it was something like 30,000 for a, for a novel. Um, so, okay, let's see if I can kind of add to it, add some more stories, add some more examples. And as luck would have it, yeah, there's, you know, the job I do, there's a lot of extra stories popped up and, and good and bad examples popped up. So, yeah, uh, f- by the time I finished it and kind of shared it with the um, publishers, et cetera, I think I got close to 20,000 words, actually, just kind of adding things into it and they've taken a few things out as well. So it was a fairly iterative process. I think one of the biggest stages where it was um, actually saying to somebody, I think I've written a book, would you mind looking at it that's quite a daunting experience actually sharing it so well and good giving the advice out in the room where it's not being recorded but when you're writing it down for posterity and, and getting some of that actually look at it and, and peers to review it that's quite scary so thankfully a couple of friends said yes it's a it's a good book i think you think you should go forward then it was then that's quite scary as well and you you kind of send it off kind of holding your breath and then you've and thankfully the publishers came back to discover your balance Nicola and then um, and Nikki and, and Sharon over there and they really liked it they said yeah let's just let's just turn this into a book so after that was a few kind of you know back and forward edits and typos I think I've mentioned in the book and I am dyslexic so they had a couple of things to kind of work out and figure out and and and, and edit um and then yeah it just came out the only thing about it is after gone through so many edits some of the you know, stories I would have found hilarious originally, having written them and rewritten them, I don't know how many times. They've only lost, for me, they've sort of lost their edge, but I'm going to hope when people read it, they still get the original funny element of them. And and also, as I said, you learn from other people's mistakes, but hopefully there is some solid advice in there for students to actually help them get their ideal job. So fairly iterative process, but a labour of love, as they say, James. I'm quite pleased I got there in the end. Oh, brilliant. And uh, I really enjoyed people's mistakes. But hopefully there is some solid advice in there for students to actually help them get their ideal job. So fairly iterative process, but a labour of love, as they say, James. I'm quite pleased I got there in the end. Oh, brilliant. And uh, I really enjoyed it. I uh, I read a lot of uh, books of recruitment and uh, yeah, I was laughing out loud at several uh, the anecdotes <laughs> that you mentioned and we'll go through some of those today. Um, but yeah, it's uh, a really, really, really great book for grads who are applying for jobs to read. And, um, you know, you can uh, check out the book or links to the book in the show notes, which today you can find over at graduatejobpodcast.com slash mistakes, where we'll, uh, we'll link to the book there. So maybe, Brian, if we kick off at the beginning and uh, sort of go through iteratively the application process. So let's start by um, starting at the beginning, which is always a good place to start with applications. Um, So let's start with uh, why recruiters. A lot of of recruiters, a lot of students will put fairly grandiose statements on their uh, application CVs make these claims that they're great at this and brilliant at that and amazing other things. And, and that's fine. Uh, I kind of get, you might have, um, you know, might believe you have these qualities, but for a recruiter, I need to see the evidence of it. So you talk about people in application forms and, or maybe on a CV, you might talk about what your responsibilities were, what you were supposed to do, but, I really want to get to, you know, the facts. Show me the evidence. Show me the measurement. What have you actually done that warrants that big, you know, grandiose claim? And if you have it, if you have that great communication skills, leadership skills, et cetera, then, you know, it shouldn't just be a claim you have to make at the top of a CV or an application form. That should come through in the application and show me evidence of it. Um, I think with the example I mentioned in the book was about this guy who told this amazing story about how he led his football team to win the this amazing kind of final game in the C stage. And then we drilled into it. We're trying to go, well, how did you lead the team? And what was the experience? We drilled into actually the facts and the evidence behind the claim. It turned out, actually, um, he wasn't really the captain of the team. The captain had been injured at the last match and he stepped in and wore the armband. But the actual captain with his injury was on the sidelines leading the team and telling them what to do and calling all the players. So he kind of almost passed it off as his achievement and um, making the big claims of, of leadership and teamwork, etc. Uh, when we drilled into it, I'm going to get into the facts behind it. Um, 
there wasn't much there. So yeah, you can make all the claims you want. That's absolutely fine. But a good interview process will get down and drill into that and really pr- get you to prove, yeah, you are actually that good. So that's what I mean. We really want to see the facts and the, the detail, not just the uh, the big, big grandiose claims. Does that make sense? No, no, completely. And you do see that with just with CVs, just the the long laundry list of um, I'm good at this and I'm good at that and I'm good at that and I'm good at that. And as you said, I'm not just the, uh, the big, big grandiose claims. Does that make sense? No, no, completely. And you do see that with just with CVs, just the, the long laundry list of um, I'm good at this and I'm good at that and I'm good at that and I'm good at that. And as you said, there's nothing or very little to back it up. You know, I'm a, I'm a high performing, really enthusiastic graduate, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, you know, you can't just, have that long list without yeah, backing up with uh, the evidence, as you said, which is a key yeah. thing. But yeah, the if you have example, it, mention it. But if you don't have it, don't claim it. Definitely, no, completely. And uh, that football example, as you mentioned, uh, yeah, we've also slightly exaggerated uh, some clips in the CV, possibly. Um, <laughs> well, uh, did he end up uh, getting an offer that candidate? Do you remember? No, we got we got to the interview. We we kind of drilled in to realise, oh, hang on a minute, um, and then he just didn't have the the credibility uh, after that. So not not just that. There was other examples and other things. If I remember them correctly. After that, I just the, the 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 facts just weren't there to back up the claims. And yeah, fortunately, he was. Um, I'm sure he went on to something better, something more suited for him, but not the role we were interviewing for at that point. Yeah. As you said, um, if you if your examples are found to be not credible, it's then difficult to keep your credibility as a candidate. Um, yeah. If you've uh, shown to be telling a few uh, porcupines, so uh, the uh, the danger the danger there. Moving on then to the next point, and this is one that I completely agree with. And when I'm reviewing applications for the clients that I coach, uh, one that I try and drill into them, is your section on perfection as standard. Take us (laughs) through this one and uh, what you mean by this one. So it may sound harsh or it's only for the elite to have a, absolutely be, be the perfect candidate. And that doesn't, you know, that doesn't exist. What I'm talking about here is if you're going to submit an application or a CV, um, you know, the really the thing here is you have as long as you have as long as you need. You've you've got weeks and months to write a CV out, and you can always spend a day beforehand or even a, an hour beforehand checking it and submitting it before submitting it and um, get a friend to read it, get someone to have a look over, run it through a spell checker, run it through all these online tools to check your grammar, et cetera, et cetera, and, um, and get it in. And then when it comes in the front of recruiter, if we've got an absolute ton of CVs to go through and there's a competitive market out there and a good, good company will get more applications than they need. You know, that's why we have recruiters and that's why we have a selection process. We have to find a way of whittling down to the, to the, to the one candidate who's going to get the job. Um, so, you know, take that time, get it, get it right. And it means sleeping on the CV or checking it the next day. That's kind of what we should get to. It's just, Get it as, as right as possible. Don't submit it in with errors and mistakes or gaps or just silly typos. Um, because then you're just making you give yourself the as, as right as possible. Don't submit it in with errors and mistakes or gaps or just silly typos. Um, because then you're just making you give yourself the best chance possible to just get through to the next stage. So yeah, I that's the that's the advice. Take your time, don't try to whiz it off or send in a generic CV or just double check it's kind of right and then if you're going to be editing it back and forth you are going to miss things and I know I'm as I said I'm dyslexic so I miss things all the time so um, if you aren't sure it's going to be absolutely perfect just get a friend have a look read it read it over um, and then when when it comes to the recruiter will receive it as a you know a pretty good CV and you don't get anything any points docked for you know silly kind of spelling or grammatical or just formatting error so yeah it, it sounds harsh must be perfect but just take your time and get it as your cv as right as possible and don't lose you know marks for just silly mistakes does that make sense completely and uh, you know for me what does it say about you? what's that saying about you it's saying that you know you're slapdash got poor attention to detail etc mm. um, and with the tools you mentioned you know i love grammarly it's yes it picks up, whereas Word is good at just picking up spelling mistakes. Grammarly's, I find, is much better at um, where you maybe use the wrong word. Grammarly yeah. will pick that out. So a word that's spelt correctly, but the wrong word for the situation, Grammarly's really good at picking up that. It's a free tool. I'll link to it in the show notes. 
make sure you just run your application through that. It just it will pick up some things that you've missed. Show it to friends, you know, yeah. and um, get people to help you. Um, if you can't be bothered at this stage, what does it mean when you get the job? It's, you know, you're not going to be bothered then either. Yeah, and I, re- I think I read an online report. I don't think I mentioned it in the book, but I have read an online report before that suggested after some, I think it was in Grip by Angela Duckworth. Um, and it talks about um, one of the key things that shows success. So people think, oh, it's communications. One of the key things that shows success. So people think, oh, it's communication skills or problem solving or interpersonal skills or, or teamwork, whatever it is. Um, and actually, one of the, the biggest indicators of success is attention to detail. So you know what details to pay attention to, pay attention to at that point in time and solve that issue or, or, or spot that mistake or, you know, pay, give, give something that bit more attention or care or, or kind of, you know, money towards our resources. Um, and the biggest way of testing that actually is if you can't, you know, pay attention to your own CV and application form and get that right when it's a quite a critical stage in the selection process, then what, you know, how does that say about your, what does that say about your attention to detail in your career and in the job? So whatever job you go into, whether it's engineering, finance, sales, doesn't matter, I mean, medical science, architecture, some roles, obviously details are really, really, really important, but it's, it's just it's just a good habit to have. So we have to kind of focus in and pay attention to what matters. I mean, medical science, architecture, some roles, obviously, details are really, really, really important. But it's, it's, just, it's just a good habit to have. So we have to kind of focus in and pay attention to what matters at, at the time it matters and get it right. It's a good indication of your future success. And that's from, a, I believe, a kind of an over 20-year study in what, in the, what are the key indicators of success, people at different stages of the career. So as I said, perfection sounds like a big, high, lofty demand, but it's your CV, man. Take the time, get it right, get, your, get a chance to get to progress in the selection process. Brilliant. Uh, great advice there. Um, so moving on in the selection process, so we've gone successfully through the initial application stage, following yep. Brian's advice, we're now on to the, uh, the fan favorite of online assessments. Um, <laughs> traditionally, the verbal, your verbal uh, reasoning test, you've got your numerical yep. test, and now all of your fancy cognitive ability, personality-based gamification situation how interested a candidate is are you willing to go through the test if, if you really really want this job you, you'll quite happily sit through these tests to get it sometimes they're there because they're just too many people applying and you need something to filter them out whether it's testing their commitment or their actual cognitive ability um but i also find you know people uh you know humans we are more than the sum of our parts but if you try to measure those parts up individually or score those parts individually it never quite add, adds up so some of the better ones are the ones where they're more tailored to the company and they're testing for things the company really is clear on what they actually want to see in their ideal candidate and they tend to be okay and work and you if you're right for the job you'll pass you get through but the generic ones you know they sometimes don't add as much value to the to the um to the selection process as, as they might, it might be perceived or kind of positioned. So I'm not wholly convinced they're always applicable, but where they're done well, they actually do help the selection process. So if you, if you, um, to the selection process as, as they might, it might be perceived or kind of positioned. So I'm not wholly convinced they're always applicable, but where they're done well, they actually do help the selection process. So if you if you really want my advice in getting through them, but the biggest things I kind of say is um think about you know uh the the attention span. So you have as a human a limited kind of locked in attention span. I only think it's something like 15 minutes you know in general. Um so don't you know just pay attention. So there is a high level of concentration for a short amount of time in doing these tests. So do that at the right time of the day when you can apply that don't do it at the end of the day and you're tired or the you're first thing in the morning you're kind of still a bit groggy from the night's sleep or you know when you're just before lunch when you're a bit hungry and your blood sugar levels down do it when you're at your peak. Um, and that, that locked in uh, concentration when doing them. Also think about, if you can, don't do them all in one go. You might get a bit cocky thinking, well, I nailed the first one. I'm pretty good at this. The brain will get tired. So you might do just as good. You know, we might feel you've done as good in the second one. Um, that's you did the numerical reasoning first because that's your strength. You're good at maths or whatever. Then you do the, the verbal reasoning. They, well, I'm on fire. I did the verbal reasoning. But your brain is getting tired. And if you have to do a third one after that, and you think, you know, that's when you start to know, you think, well, maybe I 
shouldn't have done this one now. Uh, so think about if you have, the company gives you five days, 10 days, 15 days, whatever it is to do two or three tests, do them on separate days, pick that right time of day and go for it and avoid that kind of fatigue. Um, so just, just don't do it all in, in one go. And the last thing I'd say is practice the specific tests. Again, a lot of candidates will practice generic variable reasoning or generic numerical reasoning, but each supplier out there will try to make their test unique, look unique, have different ways of testing the maths or, uh, you know, variable reasoning is, you know, or cognitive uh, reasoning tests. Just if you do the practice test, just get that familiarity with the test. And that will give you that extra, you know, margin of success when doing the test because you don't have the kind of, you're not spending as much time figuring out the way they've laid it out, what the colors they've used, or the font they have, or the style, whether it's kind of cartoony or very kind of, if it's, it's a photograph or whether it's, um, you know, whatever kind of way they've laid it out. If you're familiar with that, you stop thinking about that and you focus just literally in on the actual question and spend less time doing it. Um, I'll just add one more in, just, you know, thinking of this is don't get cocky. Um, if you are doing the tests, they're often, most of the more modern ones, more recent ones, They'll um, up the ante. If you're getting all of them right and quickly, they go, oh, this guy's good. Let's test them. So sometimes the, the system automatically updates the next set of questions to be a little bit harder um, because you seem to be good. And they want to test just how good you are. So keep a steady rhythm. If you've got, you know, fit you are. So keep a steady rhythm. If you've got, you know, 15, 20 seconds per question, if you've kind of number of questions by the time that's available, then maybe take the 10, 15 seconds per question. If you've got a couple of them in four or five seconds, pause, <laughs> have a little think, make sure you're staying kind of steady through it so you don't end up getting a lot of extra questions. I mean, if you're great and you're, you're going to nail these things, by all means, crack on, my friend, and, and get that top score. Um, but if you're not feeling super confident, perhaps just do a steady approach to the, to the, to the assessments and don't get um, added to the, the extra, don't get the extra questions added to your list, the extra, the extra hard questions added to your list. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I didn't know about the extra questions. That's extremely sneaky, but um, no, yeah. brilliant <laughs> advice there. And um, it is one, it's, it's, as you said, if you can specialise in the particular type of test you're going to be doing, um, there's a couple of great test providers that I'll link to in the yeah. show notes over at Graduate Job Podcast slash Mistakes. Um, where yeah. you, you can, you know, they all they do is just provide practice tests, and they like to, you know, um, that unique selling point is that you will practice the same tests as the the ones you're going to be doing, whether it's banking for a particular yeah. bank or the particular say, SHL tests or whatever it might be. You can practice yeah. the same ones, but you know, yeah, practice does make perfect. And they're annoying, they're painful, uh, but it's just a game. As Brian said, it's to get people out of the process. Too many people apply. This is a cheap and quick way to cull the herd of people who can't be bothered, who can't be bothered to put the time in, et cetera, et cetera. A necessary evil for you to, uh, to get through <laughs> and then progress. I think if it's generic, they, they can be, if they're generic, they can seem a bit evil. But as I said, if the, if the particular employer you're going for has engaged with the assessment provider and become a bespoke one or at least some sort of tailored one and um, they can often actually be quite helpful and you can it's, it's a recruitment is a two-way process isn't it james so process isn't it james so if you feel that you're you have to demonstrate the right skills to roll then you feel more kind of confident that you've passed the test and the right reasons and yep. you're confident going into the next stage of selection process but if you feel it's just a very generic off-the-shelf one um yeah you might think uh, i don't really need to be doing yet another one of these tests do i really really want to work for you so they they can't help the company by whittling down the numbers but they can disengage some of the you know quite capable kind of quite capable candidates another way of putting it i think is there's a big difference between getting through and going through a selection process some candidates could quite easily get through the process but they've disengaged because they, they don't quite buy into why they're being put to all these assessments and they decide just not to go through the process they you know what i'll just go elsewhere so that's a challenge for recruiters get the balance right in the candidate engagement so students who can get through the process are willing to go through the process if that helps uh, interesting point and in terms of the process, I'm moving on to the next step, which is the interviews. And I, I love yes. your, your line in the book, the next step, which is the interviews. And I, I love yes. your, your line in the book that a good interview should feel like a good first date. Um, yeah. <laughs> tell, us, tell us about this and uh, you know, why you think it's important that um, people in interviews should be, uh, make sure they're not boring storytellers. 
<laughs> so yeah, I, I've sat through quite a fair amount of interviews. I still do enjoy them. I love talking to people. I love getting to know them. I, I, as an interviewer, I just come across, if you've ever been interviewed by me, as someone who's just really genuinely interested in you. Um, I may be uncovering things about you I don't ever want to hear again, and if we're just not going to hire you, but I'm still interested in you as an individual. I'm still interested in, in finding out more about you. But some people just cannot tell a story, just cannot get to the point um and it's always ringing in my head am i waffling on here am i going on too much and it's just something i'm just super conscious of so i was asked at an event it was in um i think it was southampton university and i was thinking having been to a few kind of views during that week i think well, what is it it was an, i get the star technique and the you know situation task action result but i just thought okay let me overlay that with three things if you're if you to avoid waffling on and not quite getting to the point, you got to think of three things. That's length, personalization, and relevance. So, length is you know set the scene, have the little kind of um, explanation of what the example is, but then tell it and then give the kind of conclusion. I don't need extra information about the weather that day, or what shoes you were wearing, or you know what mood you were in. Just give me the example. Um, if you get it right, then the interviewer doesn't need to probe and clarify exactly where was this and what the context was. They kind of they get the details. And if you get it, if it's too long, you've lost the interviewer there, like tuning out. So if you're watching a YouTube video, you're talking a minute, minute and a half. If it's not getting your attention, you're clicking to kind of to skip it and go on to the next video. You know where patience are is very kind of. Uh, it's not a minute and a half. If it's not gained your attention, you're clicking to, kind of, to skip it and go on to the next video. You know, where patience are, is very kind of, uh, there's a lot less patience there. Our attention span is a lot shorter. So get the length right um, and keep the interviewer engaged. Then personalization. So tell the story your way. You know, make sure it's, it's your version of the story you're telling. Even if it's a fairly, you know, standard story about working in a, in a group and the you know, one team member didn't pull the weight, wherever we've all been there. Try to give it your, what, 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 you have done and make to remember you for who you were make that kind of connection with the interviewer draw some sort of um you know rapport there so they remember you as the guy who dissolved you know solved this problem or averted this disaster and not the kind of what well, that was the one in the blue shirt wasn't that kind of and then they're kind of trying to vaguely picture you um and you just become not not remembered you just become another face from the assessment center day or another candidate interviewed so try to make a personalized and use that use the time to build that rapport with the interviewer and remember it in a good way. Something um, you know, solve the problem. And I may be interviewing for a consultancy job or an IT role or something quite, you know, I wanted some sort of really hard business skills, at least some sort of transferable skills that map into that. Um, and then they tell me about how they set up a pottery club uh, and how they kind of convert to this old um, you know, building and they got loads of friends in, they're kind of going, so okay, that's lovely. And I, I'm really cool that you're interested in pottery and it's quite a you know trendy hobby to have. But how does that tell me you can fix the website? <laughs> how does it draw, draw, the, draw the parallels for me? So you really have to make it clear why are you telling that story? If it's not immediately obvious, make sure it does link back to team working skills or problem solving or you're detail orientated, wherever it is that really kind of um, shows you can actually do this job. So we might want to get to know you and get know more about you. And that's lovely because we're going to work with you as the whole person, not just the, the, the task filler. Um, but you got to do the job as well. So yep. use that to your advantage. When you're giving examples in response to uh, any interview, just make sure you get the, you know, not too long, not too short. Make sure that you're telling it in your way and getting to kind of remember you as an individual and someone who's actually going to add value to the team or be a cultural ad. Um, and to make sure the example is is actually, you can at least make it relevant to the role. Otherwise, it's just another hobby you're talking about. And someone's like, yeah, that's lovely, but that's a, that's of no use to me whatsoever. Thanks very much. All the very best. Good luck with your pottery kind of uh, business. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great point there. And you mentioned the star methodology and from the clients like Coach yeah. often at the beginning, you know, if you think about the star methodology, there's loads about the situation. They keep going on about the situation. Too much detail about the situation. Loads yeah. of detail about the task, what it was that they did. And then often that's it. Nothing about you know, the sort of action <laughs> and certainly nothing about the result. And you're like, um, yeah, I think we've got the situation. Loads yeah. of detail about the task, what it was that they did. And then often that's it. Nothing about, 
you know, the sort of action <laughs> and certainly nothing about the result. And you're like, um, yeah, I think we've got this, you know, we need to have a think about this and uh, sort of um, think about the structure there. But yeah, often, um, yeah, it can be, as you talk in the next one, uh, all cream and uh, no milk. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, this is a bit of a weird one. People kind of go, well, what's this got to do with recruitment, Brian? Um, and it, it kind of came to me because we used to get, I think we, we don't get as much now, but we, the bottles come like, the, the milk gets delivered in cartons a lot these days. Um, but we used to get the, the glass bottles and we used to get the um, the cream at the top of the full fat milk for the kids. And they loved it. It was like a little treat for them. And they come, that was great. So I was thinking, well, you know, you can't have the cream without the milk. It, the cream floats to the top. So kind of similar to facts, not fake. But what we're looking for is, is candidates who really have that solid evidence behind what they say, um, making those big, big claims. You want to talking about, um, you know, you're in a team and the team did this, or you were um, in in a group organization and you were told to do this. I really want to hear how you're the person who stood out, who kind of used your skill and experience and became that kind of top dog, uh, or that's probably a bad expression, but the, you became the kind of the, the standout candidate for whatever reason. So it's really about showing you have the 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 kind of experience and knowledge and the, the detail behind what you actually said. So it's about just reminding yourself of all the hard work you put into your achievements. So why are you proud of this example? Why are you given this example? And if you, why are you putting in your CV? Just reflect back and say, well, that was actually quite an achievement. And I had to do extra hours for it. I had to study extra for it. I had to work a bit harder. I had to go seek advice and help um, so I could actually achieve it. Um, just Think about what is it that got you to that point and don't gloss over the, you know, the the kind of claim and hope the interviewer kind of knows you or saw it on. Think about what is it that got you to that point and don't gloss over the, you know, the, the kind of claim and hope the interviewer kind of knows you or saw it on LinkedIn or read about it on your blog. Make sure you kind of you're, you're demonstrating the evidence behind it, but also thinking to yourself, yeah, that was that was pretty good. I'm really, you know, did work hard to get that, and make sure you get that across the interviewers. They see you're motivated and hardworking, and then it's not just a bit of dumb luck that you kind of were uh, you know, making all these claims or, or got this achievement. You are yep. someone who you can repeat that um, and deliver that kind of you know high achievement um, again and again in, in ideally in this workplace. So yeah, yeah, it is about you know floating to the top. Show me kind of how you got there. I love it, no, no, that's uh, such a such a great point. And I think again, when I'm listening to teamwork examples, the key thing is how yeah. many times are you saying the word we, and how many times yeah. are you saying the word I? Because often yeah. with the teamwork examples, you know, we did this. Again, when I'm listening to teamwork examples, the key thing is how yeah. many times are you saying the word we, and how many times yeah. are you saying the word I? Because often yeah with the teamwork examples, you know, we did this, we did that, and then we did that. And, you know, that was the outcome. It's like, great. What did you do? You know, we're not hiring the team. I'm going to be hiring yeah. you. You know, what, what specifically did you do? So it's, um, it's just finding that balance with, uh, with the teamwork examples there. So yeah. Something, yeah. something to think about there. Um, maybe one more on the interviews before we move on. And this is, uh, this is one that definitely made me laugh out loud. You talk about past, present, and future, and there's a brilliant story you've got here about when you were interviewing someone and the example that they gave. Oh, yes. <laughs> I can't remember. This This, this actually does genuinely still make me t- tickle. Um, so we had a, a, a we were interviewed for a fairly junior role, and we had a guy we were interviewing, um, going to various kind of levels, going to various competencies and, and you know, what, what you could bring to them. They were trying to jimmy the door, um, and then uh, they saw some blue lights and some, some cops coming towards them. And they ran um, and they kind of caught him and his cousin got away. So what did he do? He took responsibility for the, for the attempted crime um, and spent the night in the cells and had to be picked up the next day by his parents. And trying to keep a straight face in that interview, James was just, and trying to give him feedback afterwards. He, I think he did realize, yeah, that was probably a great example. It doesn't show me as a really strong candidate. Um, but you can see here sometimes candidates just, you know, don't quite tell the story properly, um, give a bit of a waffle. Um, I'm trying to put in a, a buzzword in there um, and you just don't have actually what you're looking for. So the past, present, future is about really kind of um, looking at the transferable skills. What do you actually have that you can really kind of make it obvious that whatever you have in the past, you, know, you can apply it to this job and you're going to be good in the future, longer term. You're thinking and behaving and acting in, in a consistent way, a consistent way that shows you're a good candidate. It, it will be a good employee and, you know, 
as a lot of grad programs are labeled, you'd be a good future leader. Um, so look at those transferable skills. If that helps. Um, does that make sense? Is that the one you're thinking of, James? That was the one I was thinking of. And um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it shows he's a go-getter, uh, entrepreneurial. Uh, you know, these are all good uh, good skills you want. But yeah, um, we've all been there under pressure and uh, suddenly you come out with an example that might not be the best example, but yeah, listeners, try and uh, minimise your criminal exploits uh, when you're in job interviews. Probably would be uh, the top tip for the day. Uh, but yeah, that did make me chuckle when uh, when I was reading that one. Um, <laughs> let's maybe move on to the uh, the case studies. So you've progressed through the interview stage. You've done really well. You've made it to the assessment centre, and you've been asked to develop or come together with a case study so let's uh, let's go through the uh, the case studies so you've progressed through the interview stage you've done really well you've made it to the assessment center and you've been asked to develop or come together with a case study so let's uh, let's go through some of your top tips and, and thoughts on this one um, Brian so one that I, I enjoyed was uh, thoughts not theory um, what advice would you give here uh, relating to this for case studies? So again, we talked before about, you know, you being an academically good candidate and knowing your stuff and having read all the books at university and studied your course in depth. Um, and then you come to an interview. And yes, you might be applying for a job that's absolutely hard word and very, very kind of linked to the role you're going for. So they become be asked you some pretty standard questions and want to get kind of some examples from you. But it's all confined in the case that example, you read it and you give a like a typical model answer. And it's like a cookie in the case that example, you read it and you give a like a typical model answer. And it's like a cookie cutter kind of clone. It's, you know, template model answer, which is, which is lovely. And you might want to kind of take the box, but then how are you showing your personality? How are you showing you are actually a really unique individual and actually have some really good skills to bring? So you want just not the theory, not just the model answer, not the kind of the academic answer. You want your thoughts on it. So in given a case study to read and analyze and, and, and show your kind of skill in kind of commercial awareness, just kind of analytical ability, maybe financials kind of skills, where creativity, wherever it is, show your thoughts. Show the interviewer you are who you are and you bring something unique and different and special to the to the to the job. So yeah, it takes a little bit of bravery. You kind of might be nervous and stressed and you're just trying to pass here. But if you can take that extra little step, show that you've got a little bit more to you. you um you actually have some unique thoughts and you thinking in it. And I can tell you the number of people who have got places in the world of work because they are different. Just, okay, let's get James in on this one. James can have some good ideas in this one. He's always thinking slightly out of the box and different different kind of angles on things. Um, and employers will sit up and pay attention to that. You don't have to be absolutely right, but if you get them thinking, man, that's an, a new, unique approach to that. That's actually quite good. Um, that's what will get you through and get you noticed. And that's what you want at the end of the day, get noticed in a good way and get offered a job. So show your thoughts, not don't just recite the theory. Does that help? No, no, that's, that's really good. And um, for me, it, it plays an important part of, um, you know, be interested in stuff that's going on outside yeah. in the world of yeah. tech, in the news and, um, you know, grab a subscription to The Economist. Uh, yeah. As a student, you can get it for probably about 60p a week, uh, which is sort of a massive reduction on its uh, sale price if you buy it in the shops. Um, they don't even check if you're a student or not. Uh, so you can just uh, <laughs> possibly might be uh, talking from uh, previous experience, but um, you can sign up for a, uh, a student subscription anyway. And um, it's brilliant for just having sort of random articles about stuff that you didn't know you were interested in. And all yeah. this information is, um, you know, just you can bring out interesting facts or come up with creative ideas when you get into that, yeah. that case study, because you never know what the case study is going to be on. It could be on something completely, completely random. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, it's great then to just have the confidence to put your ideas forward um, in terms of, um, you know, coming up with creative things, as, as Brian said. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So moving on then, just conscious of time. So let's uh, let's maybe move on to group exercises. And with the clients I coach, you know, when we get them to the assessment center stage, it's always lots of prep, getting them ready for the interview, getting them ready mm. for you know any group exercises. 
So moving on then, just conscious of time. So let's uh, let's maybe move on to group exercises. And with the clients I coach, you know, when we get them to the assessment center stage, it's always lots of prep, getting them ready for the interview, getting them ready mm. for, you know, any group exercises or sorry, case studies they might do. But of course, the, the group exercise is is a key one. And it's one that can be difficult to practice. Um and one of the key things that you talk about here that really resonated with me was the uh, the chapter on um, in it to win it. Yeah. Um, do you want to take us through this one? Yes, I'm totally robbing a a lottery tagline here. I think it was you got to be in it to win it. You got to you know buy a ticket and uh, you're not going to win it. I think strangely enough, the lottery there's some stat that says the odds of winning are about the same whether you buy the ticket or not. It's not, it's the not high, but you know you look in, you look is in. Um, but the point about it is is just. You know, in a group exercise, uh, you know, in a group exercise, uh, get involved, you know, pay attention and show the assessor you're actually awake and alert are engaged. So many candidates think, okay, I did well in the interview and I think I did okay in the presentation or I did okay in the, in, on the, whatever the online assessments, wherever it was, or different exercises. And they think, you know, get into the group exercise. If I, if I stay quiet and don't like say anything stupid, then I'll pass this too and and I'll do well. But they don't what they don't realize is yes, it's a group exercise, but you are being assessed individually. There's probably an assessor in the room who's looking at you specifically and seeing what you do. And in these in most assessments, you don't start off well, it's, it's it's a mark out of 10. So we'll start them off at a five and we'll deduct points for everything stupid they say and we add points for any intelligent comment they make. It doesn't quite work like that. You start off at a zero. Um, and if you say good things, you get points added and you get a score and you're going to get, um, you know, recognize it so really just get involved in the exercise and some very simple things you could do you can just say yes i agree good point well said all those positive variable kind of affirmations just like that i like what you said that's going to write that down and um, stuff like that is really good you could take the time you can manage the group so well i'm not sure i can kind of add anything really intelligent to the exercise because it's probably not your area of office you know area of skill or what you're familiar with it could be as you said a random topic but you can at least say well let's spend 10 minutes just having a quick chat let's spend 10 minutes writing out some ideas and structure the exercise that way um, and a really lovely simple thing to do is just use people's names it shows you are de- you recognize you're dealing with other people in the exercise so james that was a good point i like what you said there brian that was that was well said um so it shows you could have engaged in the exercise but please 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 just do not stay silent that exercise is just as important and it's often one of the strongest indicators of how you're going to succeed in the world of work. Because if you think about it, when you go to the world of work, you will go and join a group of people you've never met before, and you're going to have to work with them to get projects done. So that's exactly what we're trying to mirror in the group exercise and assessment center. And we are not going to pay you to join a company, join a team, and sit in a corner and do nothing. Um, so we really want to see you can actually jump in with both feet. You don't have to lead the group and just suddenly transform into a you know massive leader overnight and dominate the exercise. Be yourself, but at least participate. Vocalize what you're thinking, nod, nodding and saying, Meh, but positive affirmations, using people's names, managing the time. They're just good ways of engaging the exercise uh, and just getting you through it. And yeah, if you did well elsewhere, you can still pass, but don't don't lose that opportunity to go exercise by sitting there silently and trying to avoid looking stupid because actually you are saying nothing. You are looking, well, not stupid, but not like the ideal yep. candidate. Um, so get involved. Yeah, I can remember um, invigilating on a group exercise and I had uh, two people I was stupid because actually you are saying nothing. You are looking, well, not stupid, but not like the ideal yep. candidate. Um, so get involved. Yeah, I can remember... Um invigilating on a group exercise and I had uh, two people I was uh, marking for and one of them literally didn't say anything the entire time and was just sort of there sort of smiling and nodding and smiling and nice. nodding and uh, it was just like oh come on give me something give me something to go on and uh, <laughs> you know the nerves must have just got the better of them and uh, they yeah, didn't fair. but as you said there's not a lot you can sort of not a lot you can do uh, you know no. really good really good marks for smiling and nodding but uh, yeah, <laughs> wasn't going to carry them through unfortunately so now, make sure, listeners, make sure you do get involved in this stage, right? And it goes back to, um, you know, the previous point we just made about, you know, you've got your thoughts, put them into practice, right? Don't be scared about yeah. getting them out there and being confident, um, you know, can be difficult when people are, might be 
it not dominant and speaking over you or trying to speak over you, but just hold your ground, go on, which is which is crucial. Yeah. So let's go for one more. And this is more for group exercises when they're sort of back face to face, which is stand up, dumb down. Um, take us through this one, Brian, and uh, the, the mistakes that you've seen people make here. Yeah, so th- this is kind of one of the kings, one of the things that started off with what I was trying to do when speaking to university. So there's lots of advice about integral exercise, showing you're a future leader or a potential leader, or have that leadership potential. Um, and people want you to take the lead in the exercise. That's that's the advice. You know, if you want to really get the job, you take the lead in the exercise. But just think about it for a second. If you aren't very good at leading, or there's probably in the room someone who is, and you try to kind of lead and, and you're not doing very well. Um, it doesn't actually help your application. You then have really just exposed your kind of lack of skid and it's just fallen apart. It just didn't quite work out for whatever reason, nerves, lack of experience, just lack of practice. You just don't have basic facilitation skills and it can be hard. So you've grabbed the kind of pen, the flip chart marker or the whiteboard mark and you've marched up to the front. You're now full in view of all the assessors and then suddenly realize, Ooh, uh, you know, most candidates often kind of, you hear this all the time, assessment is, my handwriting's not that good. <laughs> so you're like, but what did you grab the pen? What did you walk to the flip chart? What did you walk to the whiteboard? And then to realize, oh, actually, yeah, as a, you know, 22, 22 year old student, you should know by that stage whether your handwriting is actually any good or not. And if it is terrible, why haven't you practiced it? Um, but that's for your parents to talk to you about that one. But, um, you know, you've really kind of taken the lead. And what I've seen is even worse than that. You suddenly kind of, you start writing what people are saying. You start trying to write it verbatim. And you're like, you're no shorthand secretary here. You don't have those skills. The long-winded bullet points and you're thinking about different colors and it's just your head is spinning. And then you've realized, oh, I'm just, I'm a bit behind now. What was actually said? And you lean over to somebody else in the group and go, uh, what was just said there? Now you've taken two people out of the conversation. You are just not working in the group exercise, my friend. You are counterproductive at that point. So if you can do that, if you have good facilitation skills, if you can structure random comments from a, from a bunch of strangers in the room and you can't put it into headings and you kind of do word association and you know link things together and, and do that, that is a real skill. And if you can do that, Whoa, I want to see you at an assessment center. I, I, that's just an amazing skill to watch. But if not, you can still kind of quietly lead from behind. You can still contribute, get involved in the exercise. You can lead some with some thoughts and ideas, but still as part of the group and not exposing yourself in front of the assessors, standing up and looking like I'm just dumb. Um, so it's a real skill. And if you can do that, whoa, I want to see you at an assessment center. I, I, that's just an amazing skill to watch. But if not, you can still kind of quietly lead from behind. You can still contribute, get involved in the exercise. You can lead some with some thoughts and ideas, but still as part of the group and not exposing yourself in front of the assessors, standing up and looking like I'm just dumb. Um, so really, you know, work to your level of ability, play your, your skills and strengths. Don't try to invent some skills right there in the middle of an assessment center. Uh, otherwise it's just going to backfire on you. And that, you know, no interviewer, no assessor enjoys watching that. It's cringeworthy to watch someone really fail on their feet. And then it's hard then psychologically for you to get back up after that and continue on with the next exercise. Because sometimes group exercise at the start of the assessment center, and if you feel you've not done well, candidates can often be their own worst enemy and you, you keep playing that over in your head. So just play to your strengths, use the skills you have. Don't try to invent them in the day, you know, in the day, you know, sit down, look smart, don't stand up and, and dumb down. It's um, you're right. It's doing that well. I know when I've uh, as a consultant, when I was uh, sort of drafted in, I was a junior consultant, and uh, yeah. like, I'll come along to this meeting. It was a me- senior meeting with loads of people, and uh, I was sort of uh, a scribe, so sort of taking notes. It is so tough. Uh, one yeah. listening to what's been said, and then realizing mm-hmm. you're writing that oh, have I spelt that right? Oh no, I think I've spelled yeah. that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, my handwriting is pretty poor anyway, so you don't need block capitals. And yeah, yeah it's, um, it's, and then as you're writing, as you said, you've missed what's been said. So you sort of, yeah, it's a, it's a really, really stressful thing. Um, so, you know, if you can do it, do it well, then yeah, yeah you're going to get loads of great marks. Um, but it's just, there are probably easier ways to, uh, to get your point across and get your marks in the, in the group exercise. So yeah, if you're going to do it, make sure you can do it well. If not, um, yeah. 
yeah, have a have a think about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have a word on I worked in where you know a friend of an employee would apply for the job and not get it, and then I'd ask, I'd be asked to join a call and explain to the senior member of staff uh, and his friend or her friend, and then it's their son or daughter who applied and didn't get it, and it's like, well, I don't understand why you know little Mark didn't get the job. He's you know top of his class at university, blah 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 blah, um, and then you just have to join the call and you're thinking, well. How am I going to get out of this? How am I going to explain this? And I thought, well, I'm not getting out of it. Let me just, let me just call it as it is. Um, I'm not saying you're dumb. I'm not saying you're a bad candidate or a poor candidate. I'm not saying you're useless and they're never going to succeed in life. All I'm saying is that for this job, perhaps you're not right for it. You probably have skills in other areas. You're probably good at other things in, in other ways. Um, there is stuff out there for you. There is a multitude of jobs. Do not get hung up on this job, particularly in some cases, students put on this job, particularly in some cases, students put on a show. They pretend to be, well, if I was going for that company, what, what would that, what, what should I look like? If I, what, what do they want to see in an ideal candidate? Or if I worked out, how would I be? And what would I need to be or do to be successful? And you're putting too much pressure on yourself. Just be yourself. Go, go talk the way you talk, act the way you act, you know, show the skills and abilities you have. Um, and if you get that job, you can just be yourself in that job. If you put on too much of a show and a pretense and you get the job, guess what? For the next two to five years, you're going to have to either continue with that pretense and pretend to be that person um, or hide something about yourself that you're not. Um, and that's going to bug you and you're never going to have to give your 100% to that job. You're never going to maximize your success. So don't beat yourself up. If you didn't get the job, maybe that was right. Maybe you just weren't right for that job. Maybe you just you need to kind of just chalk it up to experience. Think faith to percent to that job. And you're never going to maximize your success. So don't beat yourself up. If you didn't get the job, maybe that was right. Maybe you just weren't right for that job. Maybe you just you need to kind of just chalk it up to experience. Think faith has got to got you in hand and that's karma and you're, you're good. And then learn from it. Maybe if you can get some feedback, you might want to kind of just improve slightly in different areas or stuff that's in my book. That's the point. It's kind of learn from other people's mistakes um, and then get the job that is right for you. So yeah, don't, 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 pause or do a post-mortem on it you, you're not terrible just not right for that job that's all it is move on and then you're pretty sure in most cases you will get just a really good job that you're perfect for and i've seen it so many times especially if late students will connect with me on linkedin they'll turn up at the assessment center not get the job but they're still connected and later on i say ah he did get a good job i knew he would just not right for this company, but that looks like a pretty good good over there. Well done. So yeah, don't don't be yourself up. If you're not right for the job, you won't get it. If you are, trust me, you will be eventually, and you will get a job. Brilliant. That is a nice place for us, a nice positive place for us to finish the interview on, Brian. So thank you for that. And as I mentioned, listeners, check out the show notes over at graduatejobpodcast.com slash mistakes, where I will heavily link to Brian's book and you can get yourself a copy as well. So moving on to the weekly staple questions, Brian, you know the drill now, third time through. <laughs> um, how about you share with us a top book recommendation that listeners need to be reading as they pack their summer holidays? Yeah, so some are reading. Um, I would shout out a book called Designing Your Life um, by Bill Burnett and Dave Evans, um, available from all major retailers. Um, the book is fantastic if you are still at university and think about what's next. What it does, do a little bit, have a look at it, maybe redesign, try, try it again and move forward step by step by step and um, really breaks things down really nicely and gets you to kind of be less daunted by the next step. It also talks about how to network your way into a job and avoiding the whole selection process, how to do well and build connections, you know, and build a sense of community with different people. So the book is just a really helpful resource, particularly if you're thinking, what's next for me? And feeling that's quite a big question makes it a lot easier. And it's a really, really easy read. These guys are teaching the design thinking course in Stanford for years. So it's solid kind of background knowledge and experience coming into it and some psychology as well. So definitely, definitely worth the read. Designing Your Life by Bill Borna and Dave Evans. Highly recommended. Brilliant. And uh, I will I'll link to that in the show notes. And of course, 
uh, Brian is uh, far too modest to plug his own book. But um, as I said, <laughs> listeners, make sure that you get uh, get your own copy. Brian, often people do it. They go, well, if- Dave Evans, highly recommended. Brilliant. And uh, I will I'll link to that in the show notes. And of course, uh, Brian is uh, far too modest to plug his own book. But um, as I said, <laughs> listeners, make sure that you get uh, get your own copy. Brian, often people do it. They go, well, if I've got to recommend one book, it's going to be my own. So oh, it's, good okay. you, uh, it's good that you didn't do that. Um, so next question then, uh, which uh, website or internet resource would you point listeners to? Um, I bang on about this all the time, James. I think for students, you absolutely have to be looking at your university's careers website. They have just some amazing resources out there for free where people are dedicated to making sure you succeed at university. So there's lots of uh, advice on there, lots of resources you can download, access. There's, there's um they are constantly organizing different employers coming in. Um, they advertise lots of jobs on there as well. So if you are looking, you just don't know where to start even, I'd highly ring in. Um, they advertise lots of jobs on there as well. So if you are looking, you just don't know where to start even, I'd highly recommend just go on to your university's careers pages um, and start there, have a look around. And I think you'll all be fairly pleasantly surprised that, you know, how useful that information can be for you to find and get your next job. Definitely. Uh, it, um, they are so much better than when I was at university. So yeah, make use of them and um, mm. yeah, take advantage of everything that they have on offer. And then final question today, Brian, what one tip would you give listeners that they can implement today to help them on their job search? So I was thinking about this one, James, um, and I'm going to talk about uh, very briefly highlighting your transferables because we kind of touched on it in the interview and it is mentioned in the book um and what i'm going to do is in terms of transferable skills i'm going to be cheeky i'm going to mention three things you just really kind of you can work on now at school at university that will um, or when have you just helped somebody else achieve a goal so at school you might think oh i, I i'm one of the nerds and i don't talk to the jocks uh, i don't like them they can say in that part that i kind of playground i'm okay Come to the world of work, they could be on your project team or worse, one of them could be managing you. So you start practicing now and getting on with people you don't naturally gravitate towards or relate with. I guess that is a really, really strong skill to show. And as I said, a CV, an interview, we definitely into world work. So practice those relationship building skills. Um, also, kind of small improvements. If you look at something and it's just, that's the way it is, that's the way it's done. If you kind of accept that, the world wouldn't change, man. We'd still be in the dark ages. So think about where can you make things slightly better. You don't have to massively overhaul or completely change and radical things, make radical changes. Um, that People do that, but you can at least look and go, maybe how can I reduce the cost by 10%? Can I negotiate a discount? Um, can I do this in less time? Can I achieve this a bit quicker? Can I improve a process to deliver? Um, can I do this in less time? Can I achieve this a bit quicker? Can I improve a process to deliver kind of a, a 5%, 10% efficient gain, efficiency kind of somewhere in how it's executed? If you're walking somewhere and your boss has a million pound budget and you save him 10%, even 1%, man, they're going to be very grateful for that. So look, always look at something as a fresh pair of eyes and say, could this be better? Could this be done slightly differently, slightly more efficiently? And if you do that and you can put those ideas, um, you'll be very, you know, your boss will be very happy. So show you've done it at school, in approaching to exam or, 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 you know, an exercise you've had to do or a report or something like that. If you can show those ability to kind of constantly deliver those small gains and small improvements, really, really good thing to do. Um, and the last one is creating social value. So when have you got off your backside and done something for somebody else? Have you solved the community problem? Have you become a youth leader, mentored a young person, raised money for a charity, done a litter pick for crying out loud, um, ability to kind of constantly deliver those small gains and, and small improvements, really, really good thing to do. Um, and the last one is creating social value. So when have you got off your backside and done something for somebody else? Have you solved the community problem? Have you become a youth leader, mentored a young person, raised money for a charity, done a litter pick for crying out loud? Um, where have you done something else? That shows you've got, there's more to you than just doing what's good for you. You're not just a self-focused, self-centered, you know, um, what's the phrase, the, the, the entitled generation. You show that, just, you know what, I can be motivated by what, what other people need and how I can help other people. And then when you're in the world of work, when the next piece of work comes down or um, there's a kind of a, a deadline that needs to be met, 
the boss now knows you're the kind of person who can, you know, drop some work or reprioritize, rearrange a few things and get in and help because you know it's of benefit to the wider team or somebody else in your team. Be that good team player who helps and good team player who helps and who's got other people's backs, who is a bit more supportive. So show you're motivated by helping other people as well. Because at the end of the day, you're in most jobs, you're there to help or serve or deliver a service for somebody else. So if you were constantly just talking about what's in it for me, um, yep. uh, that may not land so well. So get that in your CV, in an interview, and show you can do that in the world of work, and you will succeed, my friend. So look at those transferable skills, and that'll help you. You know, grads often I've talked about, well, I've, I've no actual work experience, but yeah, you've still lived for <laughs> 20 years. You've, yep. you've engaged with different people. You have loads of opportunities. Um, get those kind of articulated, those relationship building skills, those ability to spot those small improvements and you know, gain, have those little marginal gains and show we are actually about there creating social value. And that will definitely increase your chances of getting any job, I, I think, anyways. Does that help, James? Definitely. No, brilliant advice as always, Brian. So thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us on the show. It's probably going to be me. So look at LinkedIn, look at the book on Amazon. And yeah, I'd love to hear what you think. If you if you get it and you read it and you want to put a comment on Amazon, love to hear it. Love to the feedback. Always, always useful. So yeah, that helps. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. No problem, James. It's been a pleasure. Many thanks to Brian for his insight today. Great A, gold-plated, careers advice as always. Make sure you do check out his book, which you can find links to in the show notes at graduatejobpodcast.com slash mistakes. He talked earlier about marginal gains and improving as you look for a graduate job. And by buying and reading Brian's book, you will be doing just that. It distills down his 15 years of recruitment advice and will, guaranteed, make you a better candidate as you look for a graduate job. All for the price of a pint, if you live down in London. Now, that is everything from me. Anything to say is get in touch if you'd like some help as you are. No matter or what stage of the process, I will be able to help. From mock video interviews to assessment centre advice and everything in between. Check out the show notes where you can sign up for a free 30-minute coaching call with yours truly where we can discuss, well, anything that you want. So head to a graduatejobpodcast.com slash mistakes and check it out. Right, that's everything from me. Hope you enjoyed the episode today, but more importantly, I hope you use it and apply it. See you next time. And apply it. See you next time.